Hello, Kidney Warriors! James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. As a matter of fact, this is a very unique episode of Dadvice TV Live. We have another kidney health coach on here that we're going to talk to. Now, for those of you that are new, welcome. Great to have you here. You're definitely going to, going to want to subscribe to Dadvice TV, and you're going to want to descri- subscribe to our guest YouTube channel in just a few moments. You'll find Dadvice TV very positive, very helpful at helping you better understand kidney disease and kind of help you figure out what do you need to do to better manage it so that you'll have a great life. Now, if you are new, my name is James. I was diagnosed with stage five kidney disease and the doctors told me I had three options, dialysis, eventually a transplant or death. Well, I'm still here. I never went on dialysis and I never got a transplant. And we're gonna talk about that with our guest today. Now our guest is very similar to me. We were both in the ICU and diagnosed with kidney failure. We were both given those same three choices. You need to go on dialysis, eventually you'll need a transplant, or else death is your only option. Now, our stories differ. They take two different paths after that. Um, I've shared mine many times, how I focus on diet and lifestyle changes, and I got lucky. There is luck in, in my story. It's not all things you can all do and guarantee to get the same results. His went the dialysis route and a transplant. He's getting ready to celebrate his 12th anniversary this week of his transplant. I'll let him share the, 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 the details behind that. Um, but then our past came back together and both of us are out there helping change the world and make it better for everyone who suffers with kidney disease or has a relative that has kidney disease by educating people and encouraging living donors to go out there and help give the greatest gift of all, the gift of life by donating a kidney and also encouraging everyone else out there to make sure when you get your driver's license, you check that little box to be an organ donor so that if you pass, you can help save so many lives. All right, let's go ahead and let's bring our guest on here. You guys may not know him, but he's got a name that's super easy to remember. Let's go ahead and welcome Sam, known as Mr. Kidney. James, it's wonderful to be on Dad Vice TV. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, thanks for having me, man. I, it just means it means the world to me. Yeah, give everyone a, a little okay. story about, hey, who you are, and uh, we'll right. just take well, it from there. Let everybody know. Um, I am, My name's Sam. I go by Mr. Kidney. That's my YouTube channel. You can find a lot of my content out there. But 12 years ago, uh, I, w- I ended up on uh, hemodialysis and then peritoneal dialysis, uh, ultimately needing a kidney transplant. And all of this you know, transpired over about a six-month period. That I ultimately had a living donor transplant. My older sister, Jody donated a kidney to me. Uh, I had a transplant in Miami Valley Hospital in Dayton, Ohio. And after that, I just kind of got, you know, moved on with uh, with life. I had the transplant things, you know, my, my health got better. And about three months ago, I just decided, hey, you know, it's time. It's time to start, you know, letting people know about, you know, what I, how I've been doing this for 12 years. I get asked all the time, or especially throughout the entire mask wearing situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was, you know, I was that guy walking around who looked just like a normal person that, you know, I was that guy you needed to wear a mask for. So, you know, I, that's when I decided, hey, it's time. I need to start making, I, I need to share this story. It's too important not to. Yep, awesome. So our stories, and I have heard yours before when you were on um, a different YouTube channel being interviewed. I can't remember which one it was. That's kind of how we got connected. Plus you're here in Ohio. Um, yeah. I was really close to where you live when I went to Amish country up there in Berlin which yeah. I'll be going back again with the kids. They loved it up there. Maybe we'll get together and we'll do something oh, yeah. live um, in That'd person. That'd be awesome, man. <laughs> yeah, heck yeah. Yeah, those are the best. Yeah, but our stories are both very similar. I had no clue 
I had any kidney problems whatsoever. All I knew was I was fat and happy, and all of a sudden I was fat and sick. And I was in the ICU with machines hooked up to me and IVs and stuff. I didn't even know what the heck they were talking about, about renal failure, renal this, stage five, EGFR, glomerular, all that was just Greek to me at the time. And the doctors told me, my wife was standing there, that um, you know, your kidneys have failed, you need to go to, on dialysis, and eventually you'll need a transplant, and it could take many years, five to 10 years. And I asked, well, what would happen if I don't? She goes, 45 days, you'll, your wife will be picking out a casket. That was the way she told us the news. Um, how similar is yours? Because I know you learned in the ICU also, correct? Well, that's where my story gets part of the story that of what not to do. James is on the way of telling what to do. My story, I actually brought out a, a show and tell. So my story started back in... 1995 in El Salvador in Central America. Uh, this was the hard hat I was wearing, uh, but I was in the Navy, I was in the Seabees, and I got real sick. We were, I was taking malaria pills for about six months while I was there. I got real sick. I came back off of that deployment, James, and um, in a routine urinalysis, because we know that's how you find out if, kidney, if you have kidney problems, I had found out that I had blood and protein in my urine. I was 20 years old. Oh, so, so remember, remember this part of it. I was 20 years old. So what had happened while I was in Central America, I'd ran this, I got really sick. I ran in a really bad fever for about four days and they believe that's what ultimately shut them down. But I, I deployed three more times. They, they gave me a clean bill of health after they found out my left kidney had absolutely shut down. Uh, they, they had done, did, they did a they ultrasound. They wanted to get their money's worth out of you. They invested all yes. that training. <laughs> yeah, they spent way too much money training me. And so they did the ultrasound on the left side. Uh, it's never good when a tech goes, hmm. <laughs> That's not, you know, it's never a good sign when you hear someone go, hmm. And so yeah. they decided it was the left kidney had shut down. The right kidney had some scarring. But it was like, ah, you'll be fine. You're going to be, f and I'm telling you, James, um, I have, uh, you know, I have the documentation to prove it. Uh, it was at an air, it was at Keesler Air Force Base. I I saw I've watched a lot of your videos and I know yep. that your father was in the Air Force. Uh, and and I'm an uh, Air Force brat and very proud of it. You're an Air Force it. brat. My son was born in an Air in the same Air Force hospital at Keesler Air Force Base. So, needless to say, I get off active duty, James. Um, I was in the CBs. I was in the construction battalion. So we built stuff, and I, I at the time I was down there drilling water wells. Mm -hmm. Um, iron, you know, ironically, because that's that's what I that's the that's the drink of choice. I exactly. I sell water. Well, yeah, <laughs> sell water. You just go get a glass out of your uh, out of your cupboard and get some good water. So that's that's what I sell. Just drink water and a little bit of coffee. So I find this out, James. I get off active duty. I talk to my family physician. I'm 23 years old at the time. He says the same thing. Well, well let's keep an eye on it. Well, you know what I hear. Uh, you don't ever have to come back to the doctor. Exactly. And James, <laughs> nobody told me, James, what kidney failure looked like. Oh. No one said, this is what to watch out for. Now, I've done many videos on my YouTube channel. One of them that I've done probably two or three times, and I promise to everybody who's watching that, I'm going to watch my YouTube channel. I'll be making the same video over and over and over again because I need other people like myself to pay attention to these signs because I didn't pay attention to those signs. Nobody said what the signs were. And James, honestly, back then, even if I, I knew the signs, I wouldn't have paid attention to them because yeah. I wasn't paying attention to my health. I wasn't my number one best advocate. And that's what we have to be as patients. We have to yeah. trust our doctors. We have to trust our renal dietitians. We have to watch Dadvice TV and all the good stuff that Dr. Rosinski and Jen and you know, Jen Hernandez and all the other folks that you have on, we need to listen to what they say. So I hate to go long winded on you. No, no, that's but okay. That's, I was in the same boat. I was ignoring symptoms. Um, I had been in a car accident. Well, my back was in pain. I still occasionally have problems with it almost four years later. And I was taking ibuprofen every day. And I didn't really think about, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm not taking too much. It ain't going to be that bad. I didn't look into it. I didn't pay any attention to my health. 
symptoms did start showing up and I just ignored them. I was like, eh, old age, that's normal. And it wasn't yeah. until I could barely stand and walk and had to go to the ICU that it really started to become real and serious. Yeah. Those, and James are ibuprofen. That's considered an NSAID. Yes. Is that, isn't yes. that what those are? Con- so and, those and are I really. I took the children's dose thinking I was being safer. Like, Hey, yeah. I've got kids. I'll, I'll take the children's medication. It's not as yeah. powerful as the adults. And you know, I was taking that. And then at night I was taking Advil PM so I could sleep at night. Oh, I bet. I, I was doing anything and everything to cure kidney failure, and I didn't that I didn't know it was kidney failure. Um, it ha, it took my wife James, my children. They're all grown now. We have grandchildren, but we had at the time my daughter and my stepdaughter were home with my wife and I. We have four children, uh, two between you know two. We each we were like the Brady bunch, but only two at a time. Yep. Um, not three. And so my, our daughters were together and Abby was only about eight years old and Emily was about 13. And I can only imagine what they were, what they went through that night because I, my wife said, you're either going to the ER or you're not going to be alive in the morning. She Mm -hmm. could tell I had gotten that bad. So I definitely, uh, you, they caught you. I was already end stage uh, end stage renal disease by the time I got to uh, Good Sam Hospital in Dayton, Ohio. Actually, a, a James, um, an ER I was physician. GFR 8. That's what I was when I got there. And we didn't <laughs> tell the kids. We made up a story because I travel a lot for work. That, oh, you know, okay. I went to the doctor and he said, I'm going to call an ambulance. I was like, no, no, I'll drive myself. I don't know how. I made it. I remember my car beeping. It, it, it keeps you in the lane. I remember that going off yeah. like crazy. I should have just um, had an ambulance or something instead. Um, my GFR was eight. We never told the kids until about two weeks after I get out of the ICU. We just let them think that daddy was on a trip, uh, which is normal to come up. And I just did a few phone calls, no video calls, so they couldn't see me. Mm. I had I had taken, I had picked my youngest. She was eight. I had picked her at I was in ICU on February 28th. How I remember this stuff, James. February 28th, 2009. It was a Saturday night, and I picked my daughter up from uh, school, the youngest. She was eight years old on Thursday. And when I picked her up from school, she said, and I was 34 years old, James. I was a young man. My daughter said, Dad, why are you breathing so heavy? And I was having, I was having bloody nose. I mean, oh. I was, I was E G F R negative. I was, I was almost at cardiac arrest. Oh. Uh, they were using sodium. I asked a ICU nurse who will be on the Mr. Kidney show, you know, uh-huh. the Mr. Kidney channel on Friday talking about kidney stones because she is a, Alex is in a doctoral program for nursing right now and deals herself with kidney stones uh, so she's going to be talking about that but i was sharing with her i said what is because she's an icu nurse also i said what is sodium bicarbonate because i remember <laughs> them putting a lot of that in my in my <laughs> system and she said well that's last case scenario that's 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 literally last case scenario so i was like you given dialysis or transplant and i'll tell you james to let you know, because I'm not a, I, I won't fool around and I won't try to pretend or fool anybody. But I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, when that doctor told me that you got dialysis or you got a transplant, I broke down. I cried. It lasted about five minutes. I looked at him. I said, "What do we got to do? Let's get it done." And mm-hmm. I'm telling you, I was a man possessed for six months, and I had six different surgeries. Um, I had some really terrible things happen to me over that time but at the end it it all ended up you know with that kidney transplant august 27 2009 almost six months to the day that i went to the hospital so when so when you were there and you got the emergency dialysis they had to put in an emergency access right yeah i had a they put i i have a video on my youtube channel uh, about it about the chest catheter i woke up because you know i was in and out because of the drugs they were putting me on they had me on um, I was in and out, and I actually woke up with a cloth over my face, James, and they were putting the, the catheter in my chest, 
And all that I heard, because I couldn't see anything, was a man's voice say, if you move, you die. Ooh. And I woke up in a bed, James. I didn't know what was going on. And for about an hour, I didn't know what was happening. I was afraid to even move or talk. And then all of a sudden, my legs started cramping up. And here I had been on a dialysis machine, and he was putting that catheter in my chest when I had woke up when they were put because that catheter goes straight into you know your main jugular vein straight to the uh it's just centimeters from your heart so it's a it's not a it's not a easy procedure so yeah. i woke up on dialysis and i did dialysis every day for a week in um in icu Whew. yeah wow i i could not imagine the the change of suddenly being on on the machine so suddenly. James, I closed three three real estate deals in ICU. <laughs> uh, no no kidding and that's nothing. I'm not proud of that at all because I I I'm a you know, I I make YouTube videos and I'm a disabled vet now. But I was I was so full tilt boogie at the time. This is why I was the worst. I am the absolute worst person to take advice from pre transplant you know pre you know now i feel like i've earned the right but as far as you know i took her all the way to the limit you know yeah and and i i just want to you know i, I want to make sure that people know that that if you don't feel good it's not a badge of honor not to go to the doctor those are called dead people you have to go to the doctor if you're sick and don't be afraid to and if if i would have just you know, stepped aside of my own ego a little while. But the, to let you know, I closed three real estate deals. Like my life came to an absolute screeching halt. And it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, another yep. day. But Well, and I look at my diagnosis also as being a thing that really helped improve my life in the long run because I was on a path to an early death, you know, overweight, eating unhealthy, lots of fast food, processed food, sodium. All of a sudden now I had to look at what I was eating. I had to pay attention. So now I'm eating much healthier, which improved my overall health and has extended my life expectancy based on the target of where I was headed before. So it actually helped me getting diagnosed. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no question about it. It makes you, it, it's a really big wake up call. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, so did you, did you switch to home dialysis later? Okay. So what, while I was in good Samaritan hospital, I have, I can, my, my doctor, my nephrologist was Dr. Oxman. He still is in Dayton, has practice, has a practice in Dayton and has his own, you know, hemodialysis clinic. So I was in, they put me in a step down room in at Good Sam and we decided, I say we, uh, Dr. Oxman, myself, my wife, uh, after one week crash course of dialysis, that peritoneal dialysis would be the way for me to go. Now that's another surgery. So I had to leave the hospital, come back and have a surgery. And that surgery had to heal for six weeks. So in the meantime, I had to go to in center hemodialysis. So here I was with the leaving the hospital with a catheter in my chest and an appointment to go to hemodialysis at 6 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for four hours each week until that catheter in my stomach healed. And the story just kind of adds to that because once I did start peritoneal dialysis, my uh, I had what was called a hydrus seal. There was, it's almost essentially a hernia and uh, all of the, you walk around whenever you're on peritoneal dialysis, you have around two liters of fluid in your, in your stomach, essentially it's your peritoneal cavity. Well, I had a tear and that fluid when I was at my, oh, it's a real, it's a nightmare. I talk about it on my YouTube channel, but I was at my office. I had just went back to work, James. And you know where the outlet malls are just between Cincinnati and Dayton and Jeffersonville? Yeah. yeah. I had an that, office. That's where my we parents live. Okay, I built a. We had built back in 2009 a three-story modular office, and I I built custom modular homes and sold real estate out of that office. Mm -hmm. So I actually went back there. There was a barbecue place right beside it, which I don't eat meat anymore, James. But I was at the barbecue joint. I'm sure I was eating barbecue, and that happened. Then I'd only been back to work four 
dang hours. Oh. I just oh. got back to work. And so that put me out of commission until the transplant. So I ended up back into the hospital and back on hemodialysis. The bad news is, is just the, the week, the Friday before that, they had just taken the catheter out of my chest. So it had only been out about three days and they had to put it back in. So I, I had, it was like a pinball machine of surgeries for about three months because I had to go back onto hemodialysis. I had a real, I, I almost didn't make it on one day in dialysis. I, my blood pressure dropped to almost nothing, passed out. It was because I was on medication because of the surgery too. So it was just, it's a, being a dialysis patient, and this is why we have to listen to uh, renal dietitians and nephrologists and all of the professionals, because it is literally like walking a tightrope walk uh, act. It's like walking, it's like the, you know, walking across the Grand Canyon on a tightrope, and there's a million directions to get there. And everybody's direction and everyone's path is different. So it's so important to work with those folks because like I said, I was, I, I uh, if it wasn't for those type of, those people, I mean, they kept me alive, James. Uh, I, when I say, talk to your dietitian, talk to your yeah. renal dietitian, talk to your doctor. I mean, they kept me alive and I'm here talking if it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for Dr. Oxman, if it wasn't for his group. I mean, just, you I can name the people over and over that saved my life at every turn. Uh, but we finally got things sorted around. And then the last three months or so, on peritoneal dialysis, which I have a couple YouTube videos I'm kind of afraid to release. I was an angry young man. Uh, <laughs> but I have a couple well, you were videos going that through I was, so much. It makes sense to be angry. You know, how yeah. could this happen to me? Um, and getting past the acceptance and, and moving forward takes a lot. Yeah, I, it's it is. It's uh after that six months was over, after I got the transplant, James. I didn't, I mean, I talked about it, but I really didn't want to talk about it. And it took me 12 years to really get here, James, because mm -hmm. it's a lot. It puts you, you know, when you get to that point, I mean, my sister gave me a kidney. So you have to accept that fact. You know, I was a person my whole life, James. I, 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 I kind of raised myself. I wanted my kids to have the best dad they possibly could have. So I did I did that as good as I could. And I worked really hard at it. And I still do to this day, even though they're adults. Um, so I've always been that guy that tried to do the, the best I can. But whenever you're you're sick like that and you absolutely it, it is a hopeless feeling, that's something you don't want to revisit. So it really takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to do what you're doing. It takes. A, I'm watching guys in here. Take uh, Jonathan, Hope with Jonathan. He's Jonathan has a similar story as you and I. It, it yeah, takes yeah. a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to do what these folks are doing, like Shane at Midwest Kidney Warriors. Um, it just takes a lot of. It takes a lot of courage to do this stuff, and they're going through it. Like Shane, I just interviewed him uh friday night while he hooked up to his peritoneal dialysis machine he did i was so, watching like, it, that one it it is so amazing that that's he's willing to do that and you wouldn't believe the comments james and the messages i've got thanking me for making that because people are like they know they're one month out on dialysis like they got to start dialysis in a month like i got that a uh, message from somebody that just got their catheter put in and that it really helped them that really eased a lot of their concerns for going on dialysis and that's why i talk a lot about home hemodialysis because that wasn't an option for me but it's going to become probably the most common option out there for folks in the future and and this kind of gets to where our stories kind of go back together we yes. both are now sharing our experience which is a lot to, to come on here to be vulnerable because there are some mean people out there um that's true <laughs> we've both gotten them i've got people yeah, that, yeah. they said the, yeah, the worst yeah. things like i would never even say that to my enemy but yeah, there are people that are mean they don't they don't realize you know it takes a lot to be vulnerable like this but we, we both do it because we want to share what we went through what we've learned so that others don't have to go through the exact same thing we've we've gone through 
And with kidney disease, there's so little positive and helpful information out there. There's a lot of fake stuff. There's all the scams. You and I were talking about those earlier before the show. Um, but uh, that's where we, we both are together. We're both on YouTube, creating lots of content, trying to get other people on here to talk about, hey, here's how this works. Here's what I did right. Here's what I did wrong. Here's what I wish I would have done. And in the end, it's it's helping people. It's actually impacting people's lives in a positive way, which is great. That's what I said. I'm going to show you what not to do prior to dialysis and transplant. But once I made, once I changed my name, James, to Mr. Kidney, that's when I knew it was time to start walking the walk and talking the talk. And I am not going to put something out there and say, you know, do something if I'm not willing to do it myself. Kind of like, you know, I'm committed to, you know, I'm post-transplant. I went from, and this is where I have a lot of dialysis patients watching my channel and they get confused, but I want them to see this because post-transplant is where we want to get them. So we want them to be post-transplant and something crazy that happens, James, from dialysis to transplant is they say, don't drink water from being on a fluid restriction like I was 32 ounces a day to drink, you're not drinking enough water. That's what I was yeah. told post-transplant. So now I'm walking the walk. I wanna walk the walk and talk the talk and really show people how to not just live and survive after a transplant, but to truly thrive and have- Exactly, you know, thrive a is life the right like word. You, yeah, a life that you could only dream of. You know, uh, be you know Joe Rogan. He says, "Be the hero of your own story." And though, and if I can, sh if I can help people with that, if I can help them elevate their lives to another level and just feel better about themselves, and like it takes a hell of a lot to get where I'm at. And you know what, James, I didn't give myself the credit for a lot of years that I really needed to because, man, I'm not one of those guys that take gifts real easy. I want to give. I'm a giver, right? I want to mm -hmm. give. All, that's just my nature. So when my sister stepped up and gave me a kidney, I just, I had no way to thank her. Like I had no, I didn't, I had no idea what I could, how can I ever do this for, I could never repay anybody a gift like this. And the only thing I could think of is to do something like this, to really go out and try to affect change and yeah, pay it forward, move, pay it forward and move the, try to move the needle a little bit myself. Now, how did how did it come about where your sister was going to be your living organ donor? Did you ask? Did she just volunteer? How did that happen? Yeah, it's pretty wild. I have an older. I'm the youngest of four, so I have I'm the I have an older brother and two older sisters. They I, on a no kidding on a Friday morning. I'm at I had my transplant, so I, all of that stuff I was talking about was at. Um, Good Sam Hospital in Dayton. My transplant was at Miami Valley Hospital in Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. So when I, I was at, Di at Miami Valley Hospital in Dayton, on a Friday morning, they gave me three packets and they said, they said, um, what's the addresses? And they were going to FedEx them to my brother and to my two sisters. And they did that morning. My sister Jody got the FedEx package on Saturday morning. It didn't sit on her table. It didn't, she didn't think about it. She opened it up, James, filled it all out, put it back in the envelope, drove it to the FedEx box and dropped it off. They had it Monday morning. And they <laughs> called me and said, you're, cause first off, when I'm ready to go, James, when I'm ready, I'm a, I can be a steamroller. I'm ready. It's time to rock and roll. It's time to get the mission done. Well, it's, it's, let's get started. I'm that kind of guy. I'm not, I'm yep. a ready, I'm a ready, ready, shoot, aim kind of guy. I'm no, I have no problem getting started. Right. Uh, just like you did tonight. You're the same kind of self starter. You did it tonight. So they knew that when they got that from my sister, they had already been dealing with me who I can be a fireball. They knew what they were up against when they got two of us. So they and they got that packet so fast. They scheduled my sister two weeks out, and no kidding, she came and stayed with me, knocked all of the tests out literally in a matter of a few days. Oh. And we were so ready. I could have got this transplant in five months from the day I got sick, James, but 
the doctor went on vacation and I was like, hey, take your time. Rest up. Yeah. I'll, I can I can do this <laughs> this peritoneal dialysis machine for one more month. You rest up. And uh, actually, the doctor who rest who was on vacation just he just harvested my sister sister's kidney. Another doctor who you can see this on my YouTube or my Facebook page, Mr. Kidney on Facebook. Um, you can see pictures of Dr. Rundell who did my transplant. He did the first transplant at Miami Valley Hospital years and years and years ago. And he actually teaches surgery at Wright Pat um, Wright Patterson uh, is at university right there in uh, yeah 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 yeah. Um, yeah in Dayton. So so he actually teaches surgery there. So I had a guy with uh, you know an impeccable record um, the night before the transplant. I, I, that's when I found out he was actually going to do the transplant surgery, not the other guy. And so I felt great. And I think, honestly, it was because I did raise a little bit of, you know, I just, I motivated them to get this thing rolling a little faster, James. <laughs> we, you know, we didn't have, I didn't have time. To, I had kids at home. I had, I had a family I had to get taken <laughs> care of. And, and, <laughs> and I have always been my number one best advocate. And, you know, yep. uh, my diet, my renal dietitian at Miami Valley Hospital taught me that. She told me, she told me that. She said, Sam, if you don't, nobody else is going to. So that's the, if I can spread any message here to you, James, and any, all of your subscribers is, yeah, be your number one best advocate for your health. Yep. And now before we kind of shift gears, I want to take a quick plug here. Um, so you, you've heard everyone, everyone you've heard um, Sam mention, hey, I've made a video about this. I have a video about that. Make sure that when you're done, when you're done watching this interview, that you go over to his YouTube channel right down there, Mr. Kidney, all one word, and subscribe. Let's help him get past that 1,000 subscribers. Ooh. As a YouTuber, yes. that first 1,000 is so difficult. And you're putting in, I, it takes hours when you're creating videos the live ones are actually kind of easier at least for me because they just happen it's on whatever happens happens yeah. <laughs> there's no editing or anything like that um but it takes so much effort and there is a lot of cost involved with this you've got all the equipment you're yeah. using someone's service to stream these and if you're licensing music and all that stuff it adds up um, so getting that first 1000 subscribers is just a little bit of a like, wow, it's it's worth it. People are watching, they're subscribing. So I'm encouraging everyone to go over and subscribe to Mr. Kidney's YouTube channel. Let's get him to 1,000 before the weekend for this first Thanks, video. Thanks, James. That's he's awesome. Here. Thanks, James. Because he'll, he'll definitely be I, back more. It's not the end of the video. I don't even want to think, oh, he's wrapping up, not wrapping up. <laughs> no, no, we're not wrapping up. That's awesome. Thanks, James. Now, so you, you got your, your sister donated a kidney, which is just unbelievably amazing. I did, it almost tears me up listening to the story and how quick she filled out everything is. I'll make sure know, I carry it with me. She just did it. She, she just knew yeah. it. I'm going to give him the most amazing gift, the gift of life, freedom from the machine. Um, just yes, absolutely yes. amazing. Now yeah, I was hooked up to that machine, James, nine hours every night and an hour during the day. So it was, it was, uh, you know, it, you know, what was hard for me, James, cause I came from the business world. Yep. So I, you know, and, and, you know, in the business world, it's about numbers, it's about sales, it's about all of that stuff. And the, you know, the, the, <laughs> The rah rah, right? The rah, and I love the rah rah. I was the rah rah. I was the. I was always the rah rah guy. I was the no, cheerleader, right? <laughs> but I could never really get. There was nothing. I. It was almost like I had won the Super Bowl. I couldn't get. I couldn't fabricate getting pumped up or motivated about something. Uh, like selling a home or something like that, or building a house ever again. It just wasn't until I started mm -hmm. making these videos and. Like you said, um, the you know that first thousand sub. Heck, my first one hundred subscribers. I worked so hard. <laughs> I mean, I worked so hard to get those guys, and and I appreciate. They're still a lot of them are still yep. with me, and I appreciate them so much. And I'm just looking here. I'm like glancing over to the side and looking at all of these folks who are part of my you know channel and and in here supporting. It just means 
the world to me. Uh, but yeah, it, that hundred was just so difficult. But it, I, I really appreciate all you're doing, James. Yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get to the thousand, and together we're gonna keep going, um, growing and growing and growing, helping people improve their quality of life. Why they happen to just have kidney disease? Yeah. Now for sure. On on my channel, I talk a lot about hopefully early detection, early intervention, because I have no experience on dialysis or that side of kidney disease. Um, I got very lucky. I was able to focus on diet and lifestyle changes, stop using that ibuprofen, I stopped fast food, sodas, and I was able to improve my labs and I'm symptom free. My kidneys are still taking a beating. You know, they're not loving me as much as they should. Um, but we're getting along great and life, it, you couldn't even tell I'm out and doing whatever I want. Um, but those are the types of videos I cover, you know, the before dialysis. Can you tell the audience what the types of videos and interviews that you do on your channel? So they know why they should also subscribe to yours and check out your videos. So I want to try to make some of that content too. And I, I'll go on like the National Kidney Foundation's website and find like the top 10 best foods for kidneys and and just try to make some good content out there for folks. But, you know, really the meat and potatoes, I shouldn't even use that the analogy because I don't eat meat. I eat mostly I don't vegetables, eat, James. I rarely eat potatoes <laughs> but, because of the carbs but, but, uh, and meat but, is a very <laughs> rare thing for me. Yeah, but kind of the meat and potatoes of the Mr. Kidney um, YouTube channel is dialysis that was originally my focus because dialysis left such a pain point in my life um it left a void and uh, i spoke with a young lady victoria who's had like three kidney transplants she's was my i want to say my third home hemodialysis video in the series um her and i talked about this void that is left after dialysis and after transplant and especially when you do home dialysis and you have all this inventory your home turns into a warehouse and you have all this inventory and you have this machine and it's and you're utilizing sterile protocols and things like this that aren't normally happening in your home and then you come home from this transplant and there's this void left in your life and it really there was a lot of n n another another thing is i was sent home with like it was almost like coming back off deployment. A couple of deployments I came back off of. Yeah. It was like, here you go, boys, go home. You know, and and there was no working that stuff out kind of thing. So there's that void that that was left. So I thought dialysis left a real void in my life, James. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure that I made content for the folks who are tethered to that machine for hours and hours of their life. And with the new, I, it was right before we got on, I wanted to make sure I did my homework. And I always watch a lot of Dadvice TV, but I wanted to watch a couple of videos. And I had watched one with you and Dr. Butt, and you were talking about the executive order. And I only want yes. to bring that up for one, one reason, is because when the executive order in 2019 was um, filed, the um, home hemodialysis world got a... Uh, injection. They got this injection of life because it was like 80% of people on hemodialysis in center are going to be moved by 2025 to either home hemodialysis or transplant. And unless they get the transplant uh, stuff worked out a little bit better, it looks like it's going to be home hemodialysis. And I hate to say that, and I don't want to sound like a doubting Thomas, but this is just what we have to prepare for. Yeah. And this is just what I feel I have to prepare for. So I want to get as much content and I have some really fabulous people that I've spoke with. I mean, people that are even advocates for the machine manufacturer, the next stage machine on my YouTube channel. And these folks will tell what their lives were like before on hemo in center hemodialysis and what their lives are like afterwards. And you know, the big thing that I'm finding most people are having the hardest time getting over is the self cannulation or, you know, needles using the needle. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't once, know if I could do that. <laughs> but you know, when you're pushed up against it and you feel so bad, dialysis makes you feel as especially in center hemodialysis and there's a whole reason for it and we can get into that but 
it's so it's like I said, it's such a pain point that they they find a way to make sure that that's not so big of a deal. And it's amazing how they all feel. And I want to spread that message. So these home hemodialysis playlists, I also just started a peritoneal dialysis playlist, which with only one video, and I can do a lot more on that side because I was also home peritoneal dialysis. And I'm even interviewing folks on nocturnal hemodialysis. I want to cover all the modalities of dialysis because there's just not that catalog of work on the internet for people who are getting that news like you and I got the yep. three things, right? Dialysis, transplant, or death. And they're, they're, they're told that, and now they're searching dialysis because they know that's the most reasonable, rational thing that's probably going to happen first. And now we have, we're building that catalog. And, you know, especially if anybody's watching your channel and they are on those modalities, contact me. I'm, I want to talk to you. They're pre-recorded. They're not live. So if there's anything in there later on you feel uncomfortable with, I am more than happy to take out or because I can start cutting it up, James. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't want I so I can start cutting it up and get people loosened up and they'll say something that they're you know, I, I don't wanna but because it's not all it's all an old doom and gloom. In fact, it's the opposite. If you watch my home hemodialysis videos, these are people that are full of life. They mm -hmm. have their life back. Jimmy Bates, uh my first interview, Don and Jimmy Bates. Jimmy is on that machine for two and a half hours and goes out and hops on his Harley. James, when I was on di home, when I was on hemodialysis in center, I hopped in the passenger seat of my wife's car and tried not to get sick on the way home. Yeah. So it's a it's a story of hey, these are people who are thriving on this modality, and I want to be able to share that with folks. Yeah, and then they may have tips that can help those so that it's not miserable. Now we have a question right here. Um, Alexandra asks, how does your home environment change? when you have to start doing home treatments? The mate, well, first off, as far as me, I did peritoneal dialysis and my um, Dr. Oxman, who I talked about over in Dayton, Ohio, he had a peritoneal dialysis nurse who I then went, my wife and I both, because we're a team. Like this was, you know, we've, we're, we're on, you know, year 18 together. So we're, we've been a team throughout this entire process, James. So. We went and met her name was Donna, our nurse, and Donna trained us just for literally an afternoon, followed us home, and it was that easy on peritoneal dialysis. Um, back then, the only thing they said for peritoneal dialysis was when you're, when you're opening that port to your stomach, it's an open, it's open to the cavity, your, your cavity of your body. It's uh -huh. open to that. So they don't want pets in the room. They want ceiling fans blown around. It's so great that she asked this, and I just interviewed Shane because I forgot all this stuff. Shane Blanchard, remind, you know, he retaught me this stuff Friday night. But then, like Shane's dog, um, Henry knew when he was done and started scratching on the door because he could hear the, the, the sound of the, uh, the beep go off on the machine. Yeah. So, and I used, and same thing, that's when I would let my, my dog in. Now, um, as far as the home hemodialysis, I do have some folks who talk about that on the YouTube channel, and I don't want to speak directly on that because that's why I interview them. They're the pro professionals at that. I'll let I'll let you watch those videos and find out. Uh, but they they do say it's not as as strict as what most people think it is, and almost every well every one of these dialysis companies they come out and inspect the home prior to you know okaying it. Because they yeah. want to make sure that it's a clean environment that nobody's going to get sick. And then you need a lot of space to store all the equipment. I've seen photos. It's an entire room of boxes that UPS or someone delivers once a month or so. And <laughs> Yeah, Baxter Baxter the, uh, delivered it. The manufacturer of the, hemo, the, or the peritoneal dialysis machine, mm -hmm. they actually had a truck and a driver who delivered it, and they were really good. But I was fortunate. I lived in a big house at the time, so we had plenty of room. I wouldn't know what we would do now. But something, and this is probably something hopefully we can get. I see a lot of my um, home hemodialysis people in the room. Um, as far as home hemodialysis, 
they this next stage machine they've actually designed a a water filtering system that helps with a lot of that and they don't have to store as much um as much you know like a uh, product as you would have to on peritoneal dialysis but i know peritoneal dialysis i literally had like a wall built in my house out of boxes there's so many of them yeah oh i i've seen the photos it's absolutely amazing um let's see if anyone has any questions anybody i'm looking through here do you see any questions that may have popped up uh, i'm not seeing i let's see no we, i think we just have a lot of people really yeah. uh i, I see support. a lot of support man yeah. yeah i see a lot of support man james uh james i have like i have a um i have a, a when i interview these folks for dialysis for home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis i have a little i call it a support shane actually called it a support group um on on facebook i've added i'll i'll add people to a group text essentially is what it is of everybody who's been on and no kidding not long ago one of my friends who i've made you know that i've interviewed his mother passed away and that was somewhere he actually went to first because it's like it's become his kind of his group that helps him out and it, it's just uh it's amazing how you know we hear all of the bad stuff that happens online and all of the bad things that come along with it but we don't hear a lot of the special things and this is just i mean it's it's really special what you see some of these folks doing not just for you know but just doing for other people in the name of kindness you know yep so here's a couple questions that came through what was recovery like post transplant and can you also describe what was it like for your sister? Well, um, as far as mine goes, I was in a uh, cardiac care. They called it a cardiac care uh, ICU room after my transplant. I'll tell you exactly what happened to me because that's the one thing that I can speak on. I was in that cardiac care unit for 18 hours. When I woke up, I couldn't feel my right leg. That was the only real negative uh, side effect that I had. I thought it was actually um, when you're in ICU after a long surgery, they'll put these cuffs on your legs that will help circulate the blood so you don't develop yep. blood clots and things like that. And I was telling my wife, hey, the right one's not working. And her and the nurse were looking at me like I was crazy. But here it was working fine. But I had had, um, because I had been out for an extended period of time, I had developed some neuropathy in my right leg. And at that point in time, I literally could not feel anything. And under normal circumstances, I'm a pretty, uh, I can, I can, my freak out level can go pretty fast. Uh, but I did not freak out because I was just so pleased that I had the kidney transplant. I didn't care if both my legs were numb at the time, James. But I stepped out of that after 18 hours. The numbness definitely wore off. I'll tell you 12 years later, I still have pain um, in my right leg on occasions. And there's just a portion of my right thigh that I still can't feel. But I'm telling you, it is really not. It, I don't even notice it. It's not even a problem anymore. But 18 hours later, they put me in a step down unit. I started walking ASAP. I started, they had me up, they had me moving. I was in the hospital for four and a half days. Uh, the kidney woke up. They talk about the kidney waking up. My mm -hmm. kidney, my sister's kidney never went to sleep. Um, it woke up and my labs started dropping immediately. Wow. Um, I, I felt great immediately. And I'm telling you, I had an 18 inch scar in my gut and I felt amazing because the fog was lifted. You know this. You felt oh. the fog, James. You were oh, stage yeah. five. You know what I'm talking about. It was immediately lifted because there's no treatment like a living donor transplant. Yeah, no it's, treatment. I, it's I, the symptoms for me slowly got better. So it it was at one point it would be like, wait a minute, that doesn't hurt anymore. My back, my lower back, it doesn't hurt. Um, or now I can do this. It 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 was very slow for me um i can only imagine i would have been in tears if it was quick i had to, the joy from it just would have been overwhelming for me 
Well, I want to say I, I saw Alice just commented. Yeah, I talk. I feel like I know Alice because I'm always her and I are always like filling your 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 uh, chat feed full of uh, comments. So like, thank you, Alice. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate the support that you show, James. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, how was your sister's recovery? So yours was, I, and it's it sounds pretty easy. Yeah. Mine was mine was pretty easy. Um, it's easier said now than done. It was painful. There's no question. Uh, they it's a major surgery. I was on pain medication, and I'm telling you, these hospitals have no problem sending you home with them. I threw out so many drugs, James, about two weeks after that transplant because I just said I'm not taking these things because first off, they make you constipated. Oh and yeah. When you're trying to get healthy, pills, that's the last yes. thing you need. Exactly. Yeah. So, not to mention they are highly highly addictive. Mm -hmm. And I did not want no business with that. But let me tell you about Jody. Jody stayed in the hospital for about a day and a half. They wanted her out of there actually the second day. They're like, "You got to go home. You're fine." Her surgery was all laparoscopic. So wow. what what that means is is they actually inflate the stomach with air and they make a couple incisions and no kidding they pulled her kidney out of just a couple inch incision um and you know cuz the kidney is just the size of your fist right yep and after that kidney is transplanted my kidney grows a little and then her kidney grows a little and that's just kind of the body just knows how to adapt but Jody was up and running. Jody was a smoker. She she was a smoker. She had all the things you would think her health. Like how in the world is she so healthy? But she's just really fortunate and has great health. Yep. She stopped the smoking after the transplant. I know she had some stumbles along the way, but she started like eating. You know, you and Doctor um, Rosinski, you talked you talk about the Mediterranean diet. She started the Mediterranean diet. Uh, like she was doing all the right stuff because there's no better prevention for kidney disease or heart disease than a heart healthy diet. Exactly. And that's it's good for your that's heart. That's what I it's practice now. Kidneys. Yep. And that's the diet I follow today, James. Uh, I eat mostly vegetables. I eat, um, I, I ate lima beans last night. A quarter cup, a half a cup of lima beans is as many grams of protein is almost a lean piece of meat. Uh, so I eat a lot of lima beans. I like eat a lot of salads, uh, vegetables, you name it. Awesome. So Joan said, asked, have you ever interviewed anyone who's come off of dialysis without a transplant? Um, I have not. Who was actually, who was actually on dialysis uh, for just like a treatment. They weren't really... Um, end stage? No, but I yeah, know that's I, a thing. Yeah, I, I, I see it very rarely where a person's on dialysis and they come off. Um, and in each case, they've always continued to, I'm going to say the word that you and I talked about earlier that it will demonetize this video. <laughs> or just <laughs> say it's a create, good word. They'll still create P. I'll say that P. word. <laughs> It'll just P. We can't say the if other I, stuff. If I say the U word. Nah. Let's just which say is in, which is in ninety percent of the videos. YouTube doesn't like me, <laughs> um, but they still create pee and they work with their doctor and they're able to come off. But it is very rare um, for for Joan who asked about that. I wouldn't count on that. Um, work yeah, with your doctor and see if it's possible. Um, it I know. Wish, I wish it would have happened to me, James. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wish it would have happened sure. to me. Yeah. And someone else asked, Claudia asked, what are the symptoms they should be looking for? So I'm well, going to give my opinion and then you, you can it. give yours. Yeah. Anything out of the ordinary. You got headaches. Your your vision's getting blurry. These are all things I, I suffered. You're hard br to breathe. You get tired walking from the bed to the bathroom. Anything that's abnormal, let your family doctor know. They can check things. Now, your kidney's health is not standard, you know, for getting checked. You pretty much have to push to ask, hey, how are my kidneys doing? And get a copy of your labs. So you can look at them because your kidneys can be kind of bad, but they're not that bad. And they just like, yeah, your kidneys are okay. But they're you're on a path that's not good. And the earlier you can start, 
you know, cutting out smoking, eating better, being active, the better you can slow down the progression of kidney disease. That's, that's, knowing that's how my... to read those labs, knowing yeah. how to read those labs too, James, understanding what you eat and how it affects your labs and discussing that with your renal dietitian. If you take these questions to your renal dietitian, first off, they're going to give you a gold star. You're going to be the best client they have, but they want to know that because if you know that you can cut down on a certain food to, you know, cut the whatever blood lab in half, they'll help you do that. So it's just so important to be your number one best advocate and learn how to read those labs. Yeah, and it's amazing how much we can impact our labs. If my BUN is high, I know I've got to go 100% vegetarian for two weeks and I'll get my BUN almost to normal, just like just a hair over normal. Um, some things I can impact really quickly by diet changes. Um, you know, creatinine and my EGFR, that less by diet. Uh, that's kind of an overall You know, James, all thing. my blood labs are normal. My B, to the exception of my creatine, because I have one kidney, yep. my creatine is 1.5. But all of my other blood labs are normal. In fact, I had, I quit eating meat two years ago because I was told I was going to have to go on a cholesterol pill because I had gained too much weight. And that's when I stopped eating meat. That's when I went heavy vegetables, raw vegetables, as much as I possibly can. I started not eating as much. I started, people that's, call it intermittent big, fasting right or whatever you want to call it. I just don't eat so much anymore. And when I do, I make sure that is stuff that's going to be, you know, it's going to fuel my body and keep my heart, you know, and my kidney as healthy as possible. Yeah. And here's a question someone asked, was the portal difficult to do in your stomach? Uh, well, the doctor, that's that was done by surgery, and so it was really easy to connect. In fact, the video that I just released, um, call, it was hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis Friday night with Shane Blanchard. Shane connects to his, heme, or his peritoneal dialysis catheter. So go watch that video. It's about 30 minutes long, 35 minutes long. It's a good video. It'll kind of talk about everything PD, and it'll show how easy peritoneal dialysis really is. Yep, awesome. So we are coming up on the top of the hour. How'd that happen, James? <laughs> but this is only the first time you're here. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so how hopefully those who have watched have kind of heard how our stories were very similar. Uh, then we took different paths, but we both ended up in the same place at the end. We're trying to help make a difference for others with kidney disease, in, um, encouraging people to become living donors, encouraging everyone else to become an organ donor, even if they yes. don't want to do it while they're alive. But it's so, so important. And I want to plug again, Mr. Kidney's YouTube channel. I was just looking up the number. We got you a little higher during the show, but not okay, high where are we enough at? yet. Where are we at not, now, James? We're not high enough. I think we only got nine <laughs> subscribers, but maybe they're okay. busy watching us. Oh, and I'm they're sure. on their devices. They don't want to stop and jump over to, to your YouTube channel. The link to Mr. Kidney is in the description if you need that. But if you type Mr. Kidney, all one word, he'll come right on up there. Yeah, Paul says that was fast. It's always fast on here. <laughs> that, me, that's my That's my older brother there, Paul. Uh, let's, Hey, also anybody watching this right now, let James and I know after this video in the descript or in down in the comments of this video, after we're done, let us know what you want us to talk about next yeah. and we'll cover it. I'll do the homework on it. I'll get it all ready for us, James, and we'll cover it in an hour. No problem. Perfect. Let's see. Is there anything else we wanted to mention? Um, I've got a little bit of housekeeping tomorrow night. We'll be talking about loss and grief. Um, last month, someone close to me passed away. Um, I don't want to get emotional right now. And we're going to talk about that. It's someone in the kidney community um, who's been on our show before a few times. Um, we'll be talking about that. And then on Friday, we're going to do an open Q&A with a renal dietitian. We're going to meet a brand new dietitian from Plant Powered Kidneys, um, Shelby. I always remember her name because I think of the Shelby Cobra. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like cars. We're going to do an open Q&A. So if you have questions about renal diets, boom, right here on Friday. Also on dadvicetv.com, um, I added a second um, paid um, 
research study. I had to think what the name was. So there's a company that's doing research studies for kidney patients. This one pays, I think it's $140 US. It also is open to those in the UK. Hey, Ray, this might be a good one, maybe for your mom. Um, you can go to dadvicetv.com and I can't remember how to navigate to it. You search for study in the search bar, you'll see it. You'll see what the requirements are. I'll post something in Facebook about it. Anything you want to plug? Hey, James, you know, just Mr. Kid. Yeah, of course, Mr. Kidney on YouTube. I want to thank everybody for watching. You know, there's there's so many people that showed up here to, you know, just that showed support to me that I've, I've only known now in the past few months here on YouTube. And it just shows like, you know, we kind of started off at the beginning and said there's can be some mean people out there, but there's they're just like that. Shane we got the from, good ones you know, here. Yeah, Shane from Midwest Kidney Warriors. Shane, Shane's a car guy. He manages a yeah. car dealership out in in Iowa. He's waiting on a kidney transplant. He's on peritoneal dialysis. Um, Dude, Shane's Shane. an amazing guy. We, you should email me. I until recently, due to COVID downsizing, I worked for a company called CDK. We sold software for okay. um, those for car dealers, and I've always been in the auto industry, and okay. I'm hoping to start a new job very very soon at another manufacturer which i miss okay. working for the manufacturers i like that part <laughs> yeah that's that's the world i came from i came out of manufacturing i sold manufactured housing for years that's how i moved down towards you there was a manufacturer uh that i worked at a manufacturing facility i sold uh you know, I was one of their, you know, factory sales folks, but I, I worked at a manufacturing facility down in Sabina, Ohio for a long time. But James, oh. I, I don't have anything else to add. I just want to, you know, thank you for the opportunity. This has been amazing. I'm just glad that we've connected because we have so much in common and this, you know, this thing can't be talked about enough. And if you find yourself in any situation, whether it's, you know, you're you're close to dialysis you're stage three you're you you know that someday it's going to happen you know come over check out the content it doesn't have to be as scary as what a lot of people will make it out to be i definitely mo mo won't make it scary i'll make it like you know like just ordering a cup of coffee it's it should be that easy but your health has to be your health has to be number one in your life and you have to be your number one best advocate so if i can leave anyone with anything that's it. See your doctor. Get a checkup. Know what you're. Know what. Know what's happening in your body, uh, because you have. There's no one else that's going to look out for you like you. So be your number exactly. one. Exactly. It perfect. All right, everybody. That is all for tonight. I'll be back tomorrow night. So I'll see you in the next video. Bye, everyone. Peace, everyone.